All right, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Darren Dunlap. I'm a senior product manager in our collaboration technology group and um, excited to be back here in Berlin. Last year was the first year we talked about the Spark APIs. Uh, have a lot of great updates for you this year. Um, we made some fabulous progress, I think, and things are only going to get better. So uh, talk to you today really about some practical application of these APIs, but also give you a good overview as well. So how many folks here in the audience are um, using Spark already or are pretty familiar with what it is? OK, some, most people. That's good. That's a lot better than last year. We made some good progress. Uh, what about the APIs? How many folks are technical here and have looked at the APIs or are working with the APIs? OK, a handful of folks. So we have to mix up sort of the technical with the overview, but um, I think we have a good mix of that. But certainly as we go along here, let's make it interactive. If you have any questions, happy to uh, take those and, and answer them along the way. So just before uh, we jump into it, this is a standard disclaimer, safe harbor statement, just that um, everything I'm going to talk about here is public. If we do get into anything forward-looking, uh, just be uh, just keep in mind that it's subject to change, okay? All right, so the agenda quickly. Um, spend a, not a ton of time, but a, a good amount of time going through the overview and the value proposition. I think it's really important you understand why this is uh, a, um, a valuable path for you potentially. Um, we have a bunch on what's new, uh, and I'll actually go into a real, um, real world use case example that I think has a lot of business relevance and actually do some demonstration of the APIs themselves. So before we get into kind of the meat of it, let's start at a high level with what, what we're doing with our cloud collaboration platforms. So it's a very broad set of scenarios that we're really targeting here with Spark and our, our cloud and APIs. So on the far top left there, we're really talking about the off-the-shelf, you know, um, purpose-built collaboration solutions that Spark provides. Our software clients, working with our cloud, working with our endpoints, our uh, new Spark board, which a lot of people are probably uh, experiencing here for the first time at Cisco Live here in Berlin. But that's really just about buying our products and using them off the shelf. The far opposite end is actually just being able to consume through APIs technology, collaboration technology services from our cloud. And then there's a whole range of things that can be done on the spectrum in between, right? Combinations of both, if you will. Um, and the way we really approached this is about a couple years ago, we acquired this company, Tropo. And Tropo was basically, you know, they're not offering, they didn't offer any sort of product that you could buy and just use. You were actually having to do development with their um, collaboration platform as a service from the cloud that enables PSTN, voice services, and SMS services to be very easily integrated into applications. So even the typical web developer could basically write some, a few lines of script and create an IVR or puts uh, SMS services into an application. Couldn't, wouldn't, doesn't even have to be a collaborative application to do multi-factor authentication. Um, so it really came a long way from the previous worlds of having to do, deal with complex telephony sort of APIs around CTI or SIP or what have you. But the, really one of the key things we also got out of the Tropo acquisition were the people, the, the, the resources, the expertise, the um, experience they had in making API use with, around collaboration so easy to do. And so they were instrumental. Uh, that team in terms of making Spark and its collaboration API platform, the green box there on the left, as uh, easy to use and powerful as it is. And so what we're really targeting there is the ability to integrate collaboration with Spark into other applications, but also provide opportunities to expand our ecosystem through partners uh, developing solutions that make uh, Spark better fit for many different verticals or um, specific business applications that are needed. And we actually have a vision, too, of ultimately being able to enable developers to provide custom experiences within Spark itself. So unfortunately, I only have 45 minutes here to talk to you guys today, so I have to focus and can't get into the details on the Tropo piece. But there's a lot of information here at Cisco Live in Berlin online as well where you can get that uh, detail if you're interested. The, uh, so the rest of the presentation is really just going to focus on the Spark piece. 
Now, just to make sure everybody understands what Spark is, Spark is really a next generation collaboration solution and platform that we've really built from the ground up for the cloud. Okay, so we've taken messaging, not just you know the traditional I am and presence you have experienced before, like with Jabber, um, but business class messaging in terms of persistent chat, extremely secure, um, and tightly weaving that into really the meeting experience, which is, if you think about it, meetings aren't just a one-time thing. There's all the work that goes into um, teams collaborating before a meeting, going into the meeting, having the meeting and following up after meetings. So we're really optimizing and streamlining those processes, reducing the friction for end users um, and calling as well. So those times where you need to move from messaging to a call through a, a cloud-based telephony solution, which is what Spark Call is, um, that's a core piece of our, our offer here as well. Now, something really important too is that this isn't just, okay, you gotta suddenly do everything in the cloud for our customers. We have a huge installed base. In fact, are there many people here who have Unified Communication Manager or UC systems on their premises? Okay, a couple folks. Um, it's, it's a massive business for us, and the, most customers are not just gonna start using the cloud exclusively from day one, right? So there are hybrid services with Spark and make it really easy for customers to start using Spark in a nicely integrated way to their existing on-premise equipment. And, and infrastructure and, and solutions. Um, and also that then provides you know, just a coexistence strategy, but also a migration path if they wanna go and do cloud more exclusively in the future. Now that includes things like integrating with on-premise directories, calendars, um, and some really unique uh, calling scenarios too that are pretty cool. Um, but the real focus here of this presentation is going to be about that bottom left item, which is around the APIs. Any questions so far just around the landscape we're talking about? Okay, cool. All right, but why should you care? Right, that's really what's important here. So how many folks are developers or work with developers here in the audience? Okay, lots of folks. Um, and that's what I expected. So whether you're a customer of Cisco's, an ISV partner, a service provider, one, even one of our channel partners, right? There's lots of opportunities that we want to enable around doing things custom and specific for your business, whether that's a specific application on top of Spark, uh, a workflow you want to address within a customer's business, or opportunities you see as an ISV to ex you know, enhance what Spark has to offer for other customers, and, and you're with your own custom solutions that you can sell in the market. Um, so that's really a key focus of what we're doing. And of course, this is about integrating not just any collaboration capabilities, but these are, these are we think, the world's best class business um, collaboration, enterprise-grade collaboration. And so you're going to be able to not only very easily integrate these, but have amazing experiences and capabilities available for your, for your customers that you're not going to be able to get with other solutions. And fundamental to all this, too, is this needs to be super easy to develop and deploy. And that's a core focus in everything we're doing around Spark. Of course, the cloud makes it a lot easier to deploy in, in, many, in many regards, um, but not just from our end user perspective, our end user experiences, but also our developer experiences. We want to make those super easy, lower the barriers, and, and drive some real adoption. Of course, the end users, we got to make sure um, they're taken care of through this as well, right? So a core focus of Spark is teamwork. And so um, this is really about helping different functions within companies, sales, support, engineering, marketing, human resources, what have you, um, become very agile and, and really break down the barriers for their workflows to make them more efficient and productive. And so we think we can do a lot of actually pretty simple things with these APIs that'll help users or use, even enable users to help themselves make those things uh, more powerful. So it's about automation, it's about streamlining workflows, and also, as we'll talk about a little bit about here, but there's some other sessions um, at Cisco Live here, is we're, we're taking the first steps to make it easy to put our collaboration capabilities into other applications, so collaborate in the context. So sometimes users might not really live completely or even in, um, 
predominantly in our Spark applications or our Spark endpoints in another app, and you want to make it easy for them to collaborate in other apps like in CRM, ERP, or what have you, line of business applications. So a key part of what we've done, um, and this was just announced and released back in the fall time frame, is our Cisco Spark Depot, which is basically helps users very easily find applications and integrations, bots, these sorts of things that people have developed for Spark. So from a developer perspective, it's a mechanism that you can use to very easily promote and make visible and get adoption and even purchases ultimately of what you've developed if that's your business. So Cisco Spark Depot is basically where it's a web page anybody can go to. You don't have to log in even to explore it. And basically you can easily as an end user of Spark or an IT person maybe who's looking for additional applications to use alongside of Spark um, can go and consume these from our you know, customers, partners, whomever, is even Cisco ourselves putting things into this uh, depot. So let me just quick, quickly show you that. How many folks have been on depot before? Okay, a few, handful, that's good. Um, I'd encourage you to check this out because there's actually a lot of really interesting integrations and bots that already have been um, put on here. There's probably, there's probably well over 100 items. Um, and we have, so on the home page here, this is depot.ciscospark.com. You, you can see what's featured in terms of these applications or integrations. Uh, and then there's two main sort of categories, integrations and bots. So if you go into integrations, these are typically things that are, you're going to connect into Spark as an end user. So an end user can just go and do this. And um, basically it allows Spark and whatever this application is to easily share data kind of on behalf of the user. So like for example with Box, if you wanted to connect Box into Spark, so anytime you got certain uh, files for a particular room or space in Spark, were updated in Box, you could be told about that automatically when that happens in Box. And all you have to do is click this connect, go through a, an authorization flow where you're logging in with, with Box and with Spark, and that's, that connect, connection is easily made. It shows you right in the room that that connection was made, and you'll automatically get those updates into Spark. So it makes it, it really lowers the barriers for um, these sort of business app integrations uh, for users to start consuming those. IT doesn't necessarily have to go and develop anything custom. Um, so it, it's, it really helps uh, with the adoption. And there's many categories here, obviously, of integrations. There are also bots that people can go and, and, and add into rooms as well. Uh, so lots of that here. So that's just a quick overview of Depot. And I have here also a kind of summary use case of, okay, how might somebody use these integrations? Um, so this is just a HR use case of people collaborating around an onboarding process. And what this shows here is, is actually really, it seems pretty simple, but it's really important to streamlining people's collaboration and teamwork. And that is actually having in the place that they're going to really talk to each other and communicate, whether it's asynchronously through messaging or escalating into meetings, but having the, what's happening in their other applications, like in this case, um, somebody's been assigned a task in an application called Red Booth, right? And uh, that information has been automatically pushed into Spark when it happens. So the person in the Spark room says, okay, wait, I have some questions about that. Let's talk. They can very simply escalate right into a meeting right in the same interface with Spark, right? Um, they can have some follow-up content shared, and then once they've agreed about the changes that are gonna be made, that can actually be executed through like a ticketing system or change management system. In this case, we're showing that was done outside in ServiceNow. That information gets automatically put into Spark when it happens, and people can continue to follow up as needed from there. So it really keeps sort of that collaboration, teamwork, um, work stream, happening without people having to figure out, okay, wait, I got to go over here to check this, I got to go do this in this other app. They can manage, or they can stay on top of everything right within Spark. Now, this kind of summarizes the different scenarios, um, and two of which I haven't really talked to. So there's what we just talked about on the left, the business users, right? If they want to just start configuring integrations into Spark, they can do that through the depot. Um, on the far right, which is what we're going to really get into here, is the develop, full development. We're actually using, you're going to use the APIs to, um, 
to d develop something custom, right? But there's some thing, and then there's the the one second to the left, which is really the actual solutions that ISV partners might build or have built, and those are things that they can actually sh you know sell in the market either directly or they can advertise those as well through the depot. Um, and by the way, the depot, I forgot to mention this, there's a process once you do develop something you want to have in there just to go and, and submit it and get it approved. And we're working to make that an, as a, an even easier kind of self-service sort of process as we move forward. Now, the one thing I'm not going to have time to, to really get into, there was a session here yesterday that covered this really well, so you can probably review it after the fact, um, is these integ integration platform as a service or workflow connector tools like Ift, If This Then That, or Built.io, or Zapier, uh, and so forth. Has anybody done any of these sorts of integrations, you know, Spark or otherwise? These are actually, I think, a great place for a lot of non-technical or you know, more IT, but not not like really focused on development sort of um, tools that people can use to integrate Spark into things. Because basically what you can do, like a simple example is with Ift, is you can just basically say, okay, if something happens in another application, um, and they have hundreds of different of these applications listed, you know, like for example, if something happens in Gmail, then let me know in Spark or push that information into Spark. And then there's way more advanced options for that with like built.io where you can actually have very complex sort of flows that you can build. But it's all graphical. There's no development, it's like graphical user interface in Wizards. There's no actual development that's needed. So this is actually, if you're not quite ready to jump into using the APIs, but you want to see how you can tie Spark into other applications, this is probably a really good place to start. Okay, so that's kind of the spectrum. Now let's get into the, the details on, on Spark for Developers. So the key enablement tool that we have for Spark for Developers is the portal here, which is de um, developer.ciscospark.com. And it's, a, it's really um, an inviting kind of fresh, if you will, um, different sort of experience that you'd expect from Cisco, right? It kind of invites users in to go check it, or developers in to go check it out, see what's what's there. Um, I'll give you an example or an, a demo of that here shortly. But one of the really cool things is we've made the documentation not just very simple, but also interactive. So you can actually start playing with the APIs without even having to switch out to another development environment. Um, and we have some SDKs and such there too. Oops, let me see here, sorry. And go back. I swiped incorrectly there. So let's go take a look at Spark for Developers. So um, here's that same portal that was just on the slide, right? So if you click in to get started, there's just some you know nice introductory text to help you get started. You can even go and run a command right from Spark for Developers. Now the key thing too is to be able to have those interactive capabilities within Spark for Developers, you log into it using your Spark ID. So if you don't already have a Spark ID and you want to play with it, you just go sign up for a free Spark ID. It's very easy to do. Um, it just validate, you just validate via your email. And then you log in here. So you see I'm logged in. It's showing my avatar up here at the top right. But let's jump into the actual API reference here. So, you, so this is just our people API. So obviously people are the core part of, of Spark in terms of identifying who's who and being able to communicate with each other. Um, so there's a number of commands here which I'll get into around things you can do with people. But what's really cool about this is when you go in and actually look at the, the, the documentation, it'll just initially give you you know, a high level description and show you what an actual API call would, would be. So this would be a call that you can make. It's a rest, and these are RESTful APIs, by the way, where you can get your own details um, via an API call. So it'll tell you what the system knows about you, right? But you can actually run that right here in the, in the portal. So we have here our um, a test mode up at the top right. You just toggle that on and it shows, actually there's no um, parameters or data you have to submit with this API call. You just make the call and it provides information back about you. So I can just hit run and it just went off to our cloud came back with a 200 success message and actually a bunch of information about me. Right, so that's a very simple case, but let's say you wanted to list people 
um, you could go and look at that, and it gives you, you know, you could search for a particular pe person by an email, a display name, a max number that you'd want to come back, and you can actually run that right here in uh, the portal, and it'll come back for you. So this is really awesome in terms of helping you get familiar with what these APIs do, how they behave, what sort of information comes back and responses, how it's formatted. Uh, all this is, is JSON, by the way. Um, and as opposed to having to read some documentation and then separately go off into some development app or environment and play with it and try to get it to work and, and, and do it that way, this is a much lower barrier to entry. Now another, so uh, we'll talk more about the APIs, but the other key thing to note here is we also have SDKs. So these are server-side SDKs that you would use if you want to do development um, in your preferred language like Java or JavaScript. So there's probably a lot of that sort of preference out there. So think of these SDKs as essentially wrappers of the APIs, the RESTful APIs for uh, Spark. And, and all you have to do is include, obviously, those, those libraries, the Java or JavaScript libraries, into your development, and you're off and running in, the, in your preferred language. All right, so that's a quick run through of the Spark for Developers portal. Now, another very key thing about this is support. Now, we've, we think we've made this super easy, uh, but you're always going to have, at some point, going to have questions, maybe run into some issues. So developer support is completely free and included. It's available 24-7, and lots of it is, is really handled through the Spark client. So um, it's very responsive. This is, this is another sort of approach and asset we got through the uh, Tropo acquisition where where this support model and the, and the, the support um, expertise that this team has brought is, is really great. OK. So that is um, the portal. Now let's get into the actual APIs themselves. So what's shown here are the actual resources that you make. So these are REST API calls. Now these are REST API calls, are, are they use the standard HTTP verbs, so like a get or a post, or a put, or a delete, is what you do. You make that verb call to, to a specific URL, and you, you specify one of these resources. And I'll show you this in a minute. And through that, you can basically get um, like people created. You can get rooms created. You get teams created. You can modify them. You can delete them, these sorts of things. So let me go through these. I already talked about listing people, right? Listing people. Um, helps you, you know, find information about people within your org and start doing something with them subsequently in your, in your code. But we also have the ability through those, that second row there, in combination with those other resources around organizations, licenses, and roles, you have now the ability to add people into Spark and change, you know, what their entitlements are through the licenses and what their role may be. So this is something new that was added in the fall sort of time frame. Um, and this is a, you know, can help, help you a lot in terms of automation around what you're doing with your, your employees and people within Spark for your organization. Um, teams, that was another huge addition that we've made since last year uh, this time. So Teams is really the concept of making it easy for people to come together as a team, as a group of people, and work on particular topics which would be covered in rooms or spaces as we're now calling them and have people be members of those teams or rooms or spaces. And so um, there's an API called slash teams that you basically can create teams, you can modify teams, you can delete teams. Okay, So that's just basically creating the container, which is the team. Then you can also create rooms un or spaces underneath that team. So the rooms API, it's slash rooms that you use. Um, and it can do the same thing, add rooms, uh, change rooms, delete rooms. Now, rooms can also exist outside of a team. So if you just need a standalone room, you don't need teams, it's not that complex a scenario you're dealing with, you can just have a standalone room with people in it. And so it's through the memberships API that you would use to add people to a team or to a, um, a room. It's slightly different. It's a team slash memberships API for teams, and it's just slash memberships for rooms. So then you can add, remove, uh, update people in terms of their memberships with teams and rooms. Now, probably the most important one here is messages, right? Because that's the content that people are going to be sharing back and forth in, in, in 
in Spark, and that can be text, just plain text. It can be formatted text, which is something we've added since we were here last year um, in terms of being able to do markdown, which will allow you to do bolds and some you know, bullets and indenting and these sorts of things in terms of how content displays within Spark. And then you can also add files into a room with this, um, with this API. Okay, so that's kind of the core set of APIs around messaging, but there's also a really important one at the top right, which is webhooks. And webhooks is really a way for Spark to let your applications know stuff that's happened in Spark. So it's like an eventing or um, a, a way to get Spark to tell you that, like, for example, a, a message was posted in a particular room. Okay, my app needs to know about that and have it proactively send it to my other app. And the way it does it is via a URL. So when you use this API, all you're doing is telling Spark, um, okay, I want a web, an outbound webhook in a particular room, and I want it to send information to this URL. So it's a really low barrier way for app web applications to talk to each other. Because they're basically just specifying URLs and, and getting JSON content. And as long as they can parse JSON, they can communicate with each other, which is super powerful. Um, so initially, this one um, was released with basically webhooks around messages. So basically, any messages that happen in a particular room you've created a web a webhook for, that data would all be sent over to your webhook and your other application. And I'll talk some more here about some enhancements to that. So let's get into what's new as well. So I talked about some of the things that are new, um, but one of the big ones too is our presence API. So this isn't the same as uh, like presence in Jabber, for example, but it's similar, right? So this is about true activity that's happening within Spark. So what, it, what we've done is enhance the people API so you can very easily um, ask for, you know, basically do a get on uh, the people resource and get information back about somebody's present, their activity, which would be that they are, they're active or they're inactive or when they were last active. And that's going to be enhanced as well. You'll see before long here um, to show do not disturb state that, that people have set and also um, out of office information from like Exchange. So somebody has gone on vacation, they've set their, their out of office information in Exchange and that will then automatically flow into Spark and show that that person is out of office in Spark. So that's really cool. Um, the Teams API we talked about already, bots. Now this is a really important one. So when we initially released Spark, we didn't have, we, you could do some bots with Spark, but we didn't have really the optimal identity approach for it. So since then, about last summer, Cisco Live in Las Vegas, we, uh, we launched this bot identity concept during capability. And so what this does, and I'll show you an example of it, it allows you to actually just register um, a bot integration. And what that provides you back is essentially an access token, a long live access token that your bot can use. And, and, that what, and basically any API calls or interactions that happen through um, that bot show up in Spark as an actual identity. A, 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 not a person, but a bot. So it shows their avatar, which you specify. It'll show that that is a bot as well. So your users aren't confused you know, when they're interacting with a person versus a bot. Um, so this is going to be a part of our demonstration. It's a great addition that's uh, recently been made. Now, for webhooks, we've also enhanced the webhooks. So webhooks um, not just can deal with messages today, now they can also give you information about um, membership changes in a room or room changes as well. So, and there's filters you can specify as well. So if you are looking only for a particular message with particular text or uh, membership changes only around a certain person, you can do that as well. And another important thing that was added here is we've enhanced the security around webhooks where when you first set it up, you can also specify a shared secret so that your application that's receiving the, the webhook um, post from, from Spark will only accept that if that shared secret comes with it. There's a lot more information on uh, developer.syscallspark.com around webhooks. Uh, I think there's some, yeah, there's some learning labs and other um, sessions here at Spark about, the, or at Cisco Live about this. So feel free to check that out if you're looking for more info. 
Uh, admin APIs, now we talked some about these already, so I'm not going to go into them in more detail, but that's really the ability to create and manage people via the people API. And then this, this last one here is, the, is probably the biggest, I think, in terms of this is our first step in terms of allowing you to, to take essentially client-side integrations and put them into your other apps. So I talked about that a little bit earlier, but these are basically for the web um, widgets, so actually a way to very easily, without any graphical UI work or significant coding, put a um, messaging and video experience right inside your app. So basically, you just tell, you just point these SDKs or a couple lines of code to an area within your web app, and it'll just um, render the uh, Spark experience for messaging and for video right in that in that segment. So there was a, a session yesterday. I can't remember if they're doing it again, but um, look for this to to GA in the f sort of first half of this calendar year. Um, but it's in beta today, and we already have some partners doing some interesting things with it. There's also an iOS piece of this, too. So there's going to be a Swift um, library or SDK that's going to be able to um, be used by iOS mobile developers to put video experiences also in mobile apps. OK. So now we're going to jump into the actual use case and, and uh, use of the API. So what I've come up with here is um, a use case around accelerating loan processing. So how many folks here have, have bought a house or a condo or have gone through that process in some way? A few people. OK. Uh, it's complicated. As, you know, it seems I've done this as well from a, you know, a consumer perspective. It's even more complicated on the lender side because there's tons of different things they have to check, comply to, and so forth, right? So there's a, there's a, it requires a bunch of people inside of a lender and even outside to come together and for each of these loans make sure that the right things are happening, the different steps along the way. So it requires a ton of collaboration. And what is important here is the business side of this, right? Is these lenders, if they can process a lot more of these loans more quickly, that means they can make more money, OK? So um, as I mentioned, usually you're going to have a team of people that get brought together to, to help work these through their systems. Uh, and they're typically in interacting with a loan system of some sort. But they need to collaborate. And Cisco Spark can really be that glue to help them move things more quickly. And of course, a bot or some sort of integration that can tie sort of what's happening in their loan system into their collaboration tools and you know into themselves as, as well. So um, that's sort of the concept here. So we're going to talk about what what we could do with that bot, what we could automate with that bot to help this process move along more quickly. So in this um, in this case, you know, say a new loan to process has come in, so it's gotten to like a pre-approval process. Um, and so the loan system knows about that. It could be you know, essentially providing that update through this integration through a bot. And that bot could then pull the team together. So you would create a team in Spark through the team's API. And for this case, we're just going to name the team with the loan number and the, the uh, borrower's last name. Right, so the or the applicant's last name, so that the people working on it, they probably have a number of these. They can see which loan very easily and jump to that uh, within Spark to collaborate with the folks they need to. Now, um, then you could also create predefined spaces because there's typically a number of things that need to happen for these different work um, streams within processing a, a one particular loan. So for example, there's going to be validating that the application is, is um, uh, backed up by docu the documentation provided so that people aren't lying on their applications, right? They need to make sure that checks out. That you, need to, you need to go through title, uh, a bunch of work around title to make sure that that's all clean. You need to go through um, appraisal processes. You need to go through underwriting. You need to actually do the closing on the loans. So you could have rooms essentially set up for each of those and have the appropriate people working in each of those rooms. Um, and then you would assign through the membership API the right people to the right team to the right rooms, right? And then, of course, the messaging. So you, could, you would set it up through the messages API, the ability for messages to flow back and forth between Spark and the loan system. 
Now, this is just a loan example, right? We just had to pick something real. But this same sort of concept where you have sort of complex processes um, and workflows that, that require people to come together around different kind of work streams to make the whole project successful, that, this concept can be applied to, to lots of different functions, lots of different industries, and so forth. All right, so let's jump into actually how you would do this. So the first, though, let's talk about the authentication. So this is where the bot's authentication model really comes in handy. So the bot authentication, because there's another one I'm going to talk about here shortly. This is about an, or this is for integrations that are acting on on their own, really that are, would have an identity with the other users in a space. Okay, so I'll show you here, but. There's a very simple mechanism we provide in Spark for developers where you go in and actually create a, an integration. Or, um, you define a bot inside the portal, and it gives you back that access token that then you're going to use to make your API calls to Spark. The other model that we have is user-based authentication. So um, this, this is really for integrations that are acting on the user's behalf. So if you think back to the depot when there was the, the integrations versus bots, this is for that integrations tab, like for, like for Box, if you want to integrate Box into Spark. You, you basically have an integration doing things with the user's Box account and with their Spark account. And you need the, you need the end user to actually set up that trust. So what this, do, this approach does is you just similarly, through our portal, define an integration or register an integration. It provides essentially a client ID and secret that your, your integration uses to, to initially communicate with Spark. Um, but what it does is it then prompts the user to log in with their other application's account and, and grant that trust. And through that process, you end up getting access tokens specifically for the user that your integration uses. Um, so this is based on OAuth. It's much more involved. I don't have time to get into it here. But there's a, a lot of information on Spark for developers. There are learning labs and such where you can, you can get more information about that. All right, so let's go and do that actual um, bot demo. So we're going to create. This is basically the first step you would do for a bot. You would go into My Apps, which was the top right there on Spark for developers. You need to be logged in for this. And you click the plus sign here. Now you see, here's the integration option that you would use to create an OAuth-based uh, integration like we talked about last slide. But we're going to create a bot. And what you're going to see here is it's literally three simple steps. So you just give it a name. I'm just going to call this Loan Bot. Um, it needs to have an email address associated with it. We provide that. You just have to give it a name. And it'll tell you if that, that name that you'd like to use is available or not. And then you just specify, specify an icon. So I already have this um, kind of set up here. And that's the icon that's going to show up for the bot within Spark. When the users add it to a room, that's the thing that they're going to see. That's the I avatar. It's going to have a little badge on it that says um, bot, so people know it's a bot. So that's all you need to do. You hit Add Bot. And you get confirmation back. Now, the key thing, though, that you get back is the access token itself. Now, this is the only time you're going to see that access token. So you have to copy it and put it in a safe place. Um, and so I just did that. We're going to use that actually in our code here. So let me show you, though, too, that this was created. We can go. It'll show up now that we have the loan bot in my list of apps. I can jump into that. And I can actually go back. I can change the name. I can change the, um, the icon. Can't change the, the bot username, the email. Um, but the, it does give you the option to regenerate the access token. So if for some reason you lose it, you know, you forgot to copy it the first time, or uh, heaven forbid it somehow got compromised in your, in your use of the access token, um, you could come back here, regenerate it, and then just put that back in your code, and you're, and you're good to go. OK, so we. Um, we have our access. We have our bot defined. We have our access token. Now let's actually look at making some API calls. So the first thing we're going to do, if we think back to that overview on this use case, we're going to create a team, right? So the new loans come in. We're going to create a team to work on it. Now what, we're, what I'm showing here in the slides really is just for reference. Uh, and I'm going to actually use a different tool to, to do these API calls. But um, 
what we're going to use is a post to the slash teams resource. And all we have to do is set the name. So let's go over. So this tool here I'm using is called PAW. This is on the Mac. It's just a tool that makes it easy to work with RESTful APIs. There are many versions of this on other platforms. There's a popular one for the web called Postman. Um, so any of those could be used. But I like to use this because it, it helps kind of in the structured sort of discussion of it. But it also provides good information about how the the um, call could look in different in different programming languages, which I'll show you here shortly. So first thing we're going to do, which you would do in your code, is store or define that um, that access token. So I'm going to do that here in this app via uh, an environment variable. So I just copied in that token that we got when we created the bot. And I've already predefined, in the interest of time here, what these calls, uh, each call we're going to do for each step. So we have a post up here. And you see there are the other HTTP verbs that you can make. Uh, and the URL we use is HTTPS colon slash slash api.ciscospark.com slash v1. So that's always going to be the same. And then you just do a slash whatever the resource is to make the API call. So it's going to be slash teams. And the other important thing that we do for all these calls, which you would typically just define once, is you have to specify the headers. So the content type that we're going to be sending into Spark is JSON. So we specify that. And then the authorization. This is where actually the token, the, um, the access token that we got in defining the bot gets used in the actual API call. So that's pulling that from that environment variable I set. And then you just, in the body, this is the bot, the JSON that you're sending into Spark, you specify the name parameter and the text that you want for the name of the team. So we're doing Johnson loan 123456. So it's Mr. and Mrs. Johnson's loan. Now, the cool thing here underneath, right here, is the, um, the, what that call looks like in raw HTTP. Now, you can also see what that looks like in Java. So this is one of the cool things about PAW is it shows you what that would look like in Java or what, if you're, say, custom to Python, what that looks like in Python. There's, there's other options here as well. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. So all we do is, is run that call. We get over here, confirmation. We got a 200 OK back. And um, we got confirmation of the team ID. That's this first row here. Now, that's really important because that's that ID you're going to use in subsequent calls um, where you want to do things associated with that team. And we get confirmation of the, the name and so forth. All right, so that's step one, very simple. Step two, now we're going to create the rooms associated with the team. I'm only going to do one here, but you could just iteratively in your code do multiple. Um, but here, the same idea. We're going to post to slash rooms. And we're just going to set the title. And we're going to associate this room with the team by using that team ID. OK? So I have that um, call already set up here. So same thing, a post to the same URL. But in this case, instead of teams, it's slash rooms. OK? And then um, we don't have to change the headers. Those are the same as before. In this case, we're going to set the title to the room as application and documentation. So this would be the room where people would work to actually review the documentation and make sure it matches what was provided in the application for the loan. And here, we're going to specify the team ID. So this is going to be the team ID um, that we got from that previous call where we created the team. So that just flows um, down in this application from that. So let me run it. We get the confirmation back of the room ID, um, the title, and so forth. OK, so now we have our team. We have our first room. The next thing we need to do is assign team members to the team. So we're going to do a post to slash team slash memberships. Again, we got to know the team ID. We have to know the, an email for the person. That's all we need to get somebody associated with the actual team. So I have that here in uh, adding a member to a team. So again, posting to, in this case, slash team slash memberships. And then we're pulling the team ID from before. And the person email is this Matt Roofer at kolbsys.com. So let's go ahead and run that. All right, so we got the membership ID back, uh, confirmation of the team and the person. So now let's actually go and look inside of Spark. So here's Matt Roofer logged into Spark. We actually see that now he's in this team 
Johnson loan, one, two, three, four, five, six. We can go and click into that team. Um, you can see that the loan bot that we created created that team, is the moderator of, the, of that team. Uh, it automatically creates a general room for any team, Spark does, whether you do it through API or otherwise. Um, and you see we have the application and documentation room created, but you see it says, it may be hard to read, but it says one unjoined spaces. So Matt hasn't joined that room yet, because we haven't done that second step or next step of the API call to put Matt into that room. So let's go ahead and do that. So the next step is adding Matt to that room. So in this case, we're posting to just slash memberships. Last time it was slash team slash memberships. And this case, we're specifying the room ID instead of the team ID and just Matt's email. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we got the confirmation back. We got the uh, membership ID and so forth. So now if we go back to Spark, see Matt's now, it's not showing one unjoined room. He's actually in that room. And if we go to the rooms list, it, uh, the chat list, we see that Matt is part of that room. Right, so and it shows that he was just added by the loan bot and so forth. Okay, so now we have kind of the structure um, and now we can actually go and put some content into the room. So in this case, we're gonna post to slash messages. Uh, we have to specify the room ID, which we got from when we created the room. Uh, you could do text, plain text, or formatted text via markdown or and a file optionally. I'm just gonna do some markdown here. So we have that here in PAW as well. Now. Here we're specifying the room ID. Again, up here we have slash messages. And here on markdown, we specify as one of the parameters um, of the body of this call. And here you see, like I'm putting two, two asterisks on e either side of this text, so it's gonna make that bold. The really cool thing too here is you can do mentions of people so that when this message goes in, Spark will alert through a notification to Matt that some, there's a message for him. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this one. We get confirmation back over here, 200 OK, that the message went through. Um, and you see here, right here in Spark now, we have the loan bot just posted, hey, action required, Matt. And so Matt would have gotten a notification that set, showed him or told him, hey, you got to check this out. Uh, income in the documents provided doesn't match the application. Contact the customer to fix it. And it can even provide a link then where they could click, maybe get more details out of the loan system. Okay, so that's our uh, demonstration. So basically, you know, you could do much more sophisticated things also with messaging in terms of maybe even through uh, 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 the interface in Spark, be able to communicate to the chatbot and ask it to do things on your behalf in the loan system or get other information for you if you want to get into artificial intelligence and machine learning sort of, you know, working with some of the data maybe that's been provided um, and have, have the, try to automate the actual bot doing a lot of things for the end user. Um, but let me just wrap up with the summary. So um, basically, I want you to leave here knowing that, that APIs and SDKs are really a foundational part of what we're doing with Spark. They're not just you know an afterthought sort of thing. Um, they're really core to our collaboration strategy. And we have a broad, you know, an innovative vision for where we're gonna go with this. So we're just at the beginning stages. It's only been a year or so into this. So it's gonna get much more, um, capable as you see like we're starting to come out with the the voice and video and messaging SDKs for clients to put that into web and iOS applications so there's much much more to come so highly encourage you if you've had if you hopefully you've already had a chance but if not you know this last day or so uh, the workshops and learning labs here in the DevNet zone are great but there's a lot of it available online afterwards too so check that out and certainly if you haven't go to Cisco um, the spark for developers portal developer.ciscospark.com and start playing with it. Get your own Spark ID um, and uh, engage with Spark and the, and the APIs if you can. So I also set, did set up the Spark room for this session. So if you do have follow-up questions over the next couple weeks or want some additional information, you can certainly do that by um, joining the discussion through the event app. Uh, there's also been a ton of content here around Spark for Developers. Um, so all of these things listed on this slide were here in DevNet or other breakout sessions. There's also a lot of content here at Cisco Live around just Spark in general. Um, 
so that's it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time. I know there's a ton of, of uh, competing great content and opportunities here at Cisco Live. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, fill out your online evaluation. We appreciate the feedback, whether it's good or, or bad. Um, and of course, you can get your T-shirt by doing that. Other, edu you know. Uh, also encourage you to go to Cisco booth, collaboration booth, and check out you know, the new things around Sparkboard and, and how that's really tying the in-room experience with Spark and the virtual um, asynchronous stuff that can be done separately through Spark messaging and call and so forth. That's it. Thank you so much, everybody. And certainly, if you have any questions, come up afterwards. <laughs>